Welcome back to Young Heretics. Today I want to talk to you about the most interesting news story that nobody, and I mean like nobody, is talking about. Now, there's a lot going on in the world, as news junkies like me know. It's an election year, there are wars abroad, there are intra-right-wing spats going on on Twitter, and if you want my up-to-the-minute opinion on, you know, every latest political controversy, God knows why you would, but if you want that, I refer you to my Twitter account, which is just Spencer Clavin on X. You can follow me there, and I will mouth off there about this and that, but that's not what this show is about. The point of this show is not to respond reactively to every headline, and one of the beautiful things about it is it's kind of become a space for you and me to gather and become part of this larger fellowship, what I sort of think of as the secret society of the Western canon, that people throughout time and space and in this great great tradition that we call the West, people have been contemplating the highest things, how to live well, how to live the good life, and what our purpose in the universe is. And by some miracle, they wrote those thoughts down, and some of those thoughts have survived for us, so that it becomes like this fellowship, like entering into a grand company that stretches across centuries, and that this show is like a little room where we get to meet together with all of those great minds around us, and and think about eternal things, highest things, and ultimate questions. So that's the news story that I want to be paying most attention to is not the one perhaps that will have like flashed across your social media feed or shown up on Real Clear Politics, but one that I think actually might be super important. And it has to do with telescopes. Um, if you've been following along with the show, you know that we just kind of finished a stretch where we were talking together about magic and science, and I was focusing in particular on the figure of Merlin and talking about how as science develops and as our experience of the universe expands outward, the rules that we're able to determine, the ways that we're able to make patterns and understand cause and effect and, and see regularities, those rules start to grow more complex and to become nested into a larger fabric. And this always comes with a transition out of magic and into science, or that's how it's often portrayed, that, oh, those old guys were just sorcerers and now we have the real science. But that happens again and again, and it might be happening now. It might be happening with our tech revolution that we're butting up against a new edge where things start to behave differently than they did in our previous realm of experience. And I was using Merlin to talk about that, and I said last week that what I want to do now is move on to Dr. Faustus, who's another famous sorcerer from the Western canon. And Faustus really gets us into thinking about piety and the limits of our human nature, right? And how can we know the universe and satisfy this longing, which feels good in us to know truth and to be able to do more things without overstepping the bounds of what we are and distorting and destroying our human nature. And that is actually one of the most urgent questions that we are facing, maybe the most urgent question as we move forward into this high-tech age. How do we preserve our humanity? So Faustus and this broader issue of science and magic actually is desperately urgent and relevant. It's just not as splashy as the politics that you're going to see on the day-to-day, -day, and it might be going on in the background. So I want to get into Faustus, but I want to get there by way of a little detour today into current events in science, both because that's just interesting in and of itself, and also because it helps to show how this stuff is playing out in the 21st century. So what am I talking about? I'm talking about these new revelations that are coming out of the James Webb Space telescope. And in particular, we've had a recent and kind of explosive discovery that made the news, although only barely, from the latest measurements that the James Webb Telescope is making. And this is our kind of state-of-the-art telescope for getting images of space. You probably have seen some of them. They're really stunning 
depictions of what the furthest galaxies and stars and nebulae that we can see. And, you know, those images themselves have been all over the news. But what's been somewhat less well reported is the data that's coming back that is causing deep-seated, like, seismic-level, tectonic concerns or alarm among people who study cosmology, the history of the universe, that maybe some of our most basic assumptions, the kinds of things that you would have learned like in middle school about the Big Bang and the expansion of the universe, maybe those assumptions are sort of off in some profound way. And the latest instance of this has to do with the rate of expansion of the universe. So let me geek out with you for a little bit here, and and uh, it'll be fun, I promise. The origins of the Big Bang theory have to do with this notion that the universe is expanding. And it comes from reams and reams, masses of data that scientists have of observing the stars, and particularly this thing called redshift, which is basically that as light or as points of light or objects that emit light move away from us, their wavelengths sort of expand in the same way that sound wavelengths do. If you think of like, you know, when a siren moves past you, it kind of bends in pitch. You can hear that. It's called the Doppler effect. Well, light does something similar. And so redshift just means that light that's coming to us from stars moves in the red direction on the spectrum, which suggests that the stars are moving away from us, that the distance between us and them is increasing. And so if you play that tape backward and you imagine that time is in going in reverse, you would reason that the distance between us and the stars would decrease and that the universe contracts into this tiny point. And that's where you get this idea that the universe kind of exploded from a singularity, from, from one minuscule point. And I'm going to get into that part of it in a second. But for now, just the part that is now coming under question, there's been a lot of effort to determine how fast this expansion is happening. And many, many research dollars and some of our best scientific minds have really been working on this for a long time. And there are two kind of major ways that they've figured out how to do this. One is by studying what's called the cosmic microwave background, CMBR, cosmic microwave background radiation, which is basically ancient light. And it's just one of the most metal concepts in all of science. It goes back to the original kind of investigation of the Big Bang. And sometimes this stuff gets described in these very technical, clinical, dry terms so that we don't really fathom what we're talking about here. But we're basically dealing with the very first light that was able to escape from matter, we think, speculatively, after matter started to disambiguate itself from light. So if like me, you are of a theological mindset, you start to think, well, this sounds very much like dividing the light from the darkness, right? This is like the thing that happens at the end of the first day in Genesis. And we can now measure the light that kind of ambiently flickers about us everywhere. And it's obviously not in the visible spectrum, but you can actually see it if you turn on one of those old-fashioned televisions and you put up the, you know, antenna that they used to use to get TV reception, the static that you see involves the cosmic microwave background radiation. And so CMBR has been extensively studied, and one of the ways of trying to determine the rate of the universe's expansion is, is by looking at this ancient light, which just, like, feels like something out of a fairy tale or something. Then the other thing that scientists do is they look at these stars that are dying. They're called Cepheid uh, variable variable stars. And, and they're called variable because the, their brilliance, their brightness sort of pulses. And they give off this fluctuation in intensity, which is related to their sort of absolute intensity. And then you can compare their absolute intensity to how, how bright they look to us. So basically you have a way of measuring how bright they are actually are in in the light that they're admitting and you have a way of measuring how bright they look to us from earth and by comparing those things you can compare the distance between us and them and this is another way basically of measuring the expansion of the universe over time so far kind of so good you with me right these are basically two ways of calculating the same number which is how fast is the universe growing and now the plot twist these two numbers don't match up. They don't align, which is like a big problem or maybe a big opportunity. And 
it's naturally attracted a lot of attention. They call it the Hubble tension because the constant, uh, the rate at which the universe expands is related to a constant called the Hubble constant. So this Hubble tension has been like a big problem in physics. And they just came out with an announcement. This is from a the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, a peer-reviewed publication announcement that after using the James Webb telescope to measure these stars as precisely as we're now able and to sort of clear away some errors, it really does seem as if the discrepancy between these two measurements is not just an accident. It's not just a measurement error. It's something deeply embedded in the nature of the stuff that we're looking at, that these things are don't align or, or don't match up. And there's this great quote. This is from Adam Rees, who's a Johns Hopkins physicist and famous for discovering the uh, acceleration of the universe's expansion, which is related to dark energy. And that's obviously a term that gets thrown around a lot. But so Rees is like, you know, one of the big names here. He says, with measurement errors negated, what remains is the real and exciting possibility that we have misunderstood the universe. So they're saying, no, really, like it actually seems as if this stuff is more mysterious than we had led on, more mysterious than your middle school science textbook led you to believe. And for me, this is exciting and invigorating, both because of how stultifying, how exhausting the discourse about, quote unquote, the science has been ever since COVID, basically. But more generally, this impression that I got at least growing up in middle school that like science is this book of dogma that you must accept and good science teachers would always push back against this and say actually science is exactly about the things that we don't understand but often I think in an effort to instill a kind of reverence for scientific knowledge as an absolute standard of, of truth, our middle school teachers will tell you these stories as if they were like irrefutable, that science is settled, the evidence is in, and no other conclusions can be drawn. But when you really start to dig into this stuff, you realize how much of it is very, very tentative and speculative, and how actual scientists who are doing the great adventure of getting more knowledge about the world are excited by how speculative, how tentative it is and, and don't want to pound their fists on the table in the way that public health figures do and like insist that you shut up and submit. I mean, really what this is about is is wonderment and curiosity. So I love the sort of way in which this stuff is unsettling some of the science. And that's not because I'm against the idea that we should explore this stuff. It's just because I, I find that we've sort of gone crazy about insisting on the absolute truth of all scientific conclusions, no matter how tentative. And I do think, to relate it to what we've been talking about, that this comes from somewhere, and it comes from the uncertainty within which the modern scientific project was born. One of the things that I said, I can't remember, a few episodes back, is that the scientific revolution itself, the kind of transformation in philosophy that we think of now in the 1400s, 1500s, 1600s, on really even into the 1700s, that, that, that whole period is inseparable from the Protestant Reformation, which was a time when people like Luther and Calvin were, Call and Zwingli and all these other guys, were questioning the absolute authority of the church as an interpreter of the Bible. Which means that the solid ground that we had built our intellectual foundation on, this kind of, well, here's the baseline we can all agree on and then we'll work from there, that solid ground started to crumble. And even if you then say, well, okay, Calvin was right, and so now I'm going to become a Calvinist, you're still in a fundamentally different position from, say, a Catholic in the, you know, 12th century, because now, even though you think you've got the solid ground of Calvinism, you are aware that you are only one among a number of different people in a number of different sects, and that that ground is not indisputable, and it doesn't count as like some bedrock of reality. And the scientific revolution, which was a philosophical revolution, was a a mad dash, a race among various different philosophers to find a new solid ground, something that could be absolutely known. You've got Francis Bacon, who's over here saying, well, like maybe it's the 
experience of our senses. Maybe it's what we can touch and see directly, but there's all these problems with that because we always have ideas that are involved in how we interpret the senses. And so Descartes is over here saying, no, actually, it's like the mind, only pure ideas can be surely and absolutely known. But you see how gradually over time, what you end up with is this, you know, scientific method with the idea that if you can observe something and then confirm it with experiment and, you know, design experiments that question specific hypotheses and give you yes or no answers to particular questions and so on and so forth, then you can know things at least about the physical world. Now, there's a whole other story about how this, like, was never really all that secure, a, an epistemological project, and how it got kind of poked at for a while in the 20th century until Karl Popper kind of reinvigorated it. But basically, the attitude that we now have about science is an, is an attitude of fear that is afraid that this new standard of truth we've developed is losing ground because it's insufficient, which it never was supposed to be, or the best scientists never never thought that it would be sufficient. There was always going to be metaphysics, there's always going to be religion that gives meaning to our endeavors, but once you start to lose that, then science becomes unable to explain major realities in our life, like love and desire and purpose and all this stuff. And so now you have the scientific Scientism attitude, what I've, you know, referred to before on the show as scientism, which is this notion that, like, you must accept science as your full and exhaustive rule book for life, which science is incapable of being because it always has to have this open-ended nature. There actually, by necessity, needs to be a larger field of play that it's always moving out into. And so I love this Hubble James Webb stuff because it's an example of, you know, the quote unquote settled science getting unsettled in this very scientific and, and exciting way. But scientific in the true meaning of that word, which is to say that at the edges of our experience, we are bound to encounter things that don't follow the rules that we've written for what was previously the limitation of our experience. We were in this little circle and this little bubble, and within this bubble we saw the rules that always happen, and then we moved out beyond the bubble, or we looked way, way down small within the bubble, and we discovered that there are other rules going on, and those, and we have to find out how those rules are related and get a bigger pattern. And so that's part of what's going on here, and it's not unrelated to another major news event that you may or may not have heard of, which also has to do with what James Webb has discovered. And, and it's a slightly different problem with cosmology. So now we've got two crisis level tectonic problems with cosmology. And the other one, which I like even better, this one's even f more fun. I, uh, I almost said funner. This one's even funner, let's say. And that is the uh, old galaxies that are really, really far away. And so again, allow me to nerd out a second time. I guess I shouldn't just announce that I'm nerding out because the whole podcast is is nerding out. But I feel like I'm really nerding out now. But also, it's awesome. So, okay. Far, far, far away from us, James Webb has found some galaxies that are, that look very old. Or at least that are, are very, very big. And usually we think that to get big, galaxies need to be old. But here's the problem. One of the major elements of cosmology is that when you look further away, light takes a longer time to travel to you. And so looking further away is kind of like looking back in time is one way that people describe it. Another incredibly metal concept that just gets kind of casually brushed off. But yeah, so light takes a long time. So we think that the further away we look, the further back in time we're looking. And it would follow that these far, far away galaxies that we're now able to access with the telescope should be very young because we're looking back into their origins, essentially. Except that there are these old galaxies in what should be, for our, from our perspective, the youngest part of the universe. And here's a, I'll, I'll link to these d descriptions, but this is Ivo Labe uh, telling the story of, of the whole thing. And he says, I run the analysis software on the little pin pinprick, and it spits out two numbers. Distance, 13.1 billion light years. Mass, 100 billion stars. And I nearly spit out my coffee. We just discovered the impossible, impossibly early, impossibly massive galaxies. 
At this distance, the light took 13 billion years to reach us, so we are seeing the galaxies at a time when the universe was only 700 million years old, barely 5% of its current age of 13.8 billion years. If this is true, this galaxy has formed as many stars as our present-day Milky Way in record time. And where there is one, there are more. One day later, I had found six. Okay, so this did kind of make the rounds in the news cycle back when it came out. And one of the things I saw people sharing online was this paper that came out in response to these discoveries, speculating that the universe might actually be twice as old as it was initially supposed to be. So not 13 billion, but somewhere around 27 billion. I forget the figure they came up with. And what was really funny to me is people were sharing this with a kind of triumphalist, you know, and I, I get this because, as I just said, like the science has been presented as this sort of offensive dogma, which makes people, especially religious people like me, very defensive and angry. And we kind of want science to fail when it's presented that way. When when somebody comes to us and says, like, science now shows that your religion is just chemicals in the brain, that's obviously so stupid. And so, like, far into this kind of weird scientific revolution brain where, like, science is the only one absolute truth, that we then react with hostility to science as if science itself were sort of anti-faith. And that's where you get, in part, this so-called conflict between science and religion is, is not from science itself or even from the greatest scientists and scientific philosophers, but rather, really, from the polemicists who then take science and the scientific project for their own political or philosophical purposes. People like Pierre-Simon Laplace in France, and then, you know, later on, some of the interpreters of Darwin, the followers of Darwin, will say, now there's this war between science and religion. And I have to say, you know, pe religious people sometimes take the bait. And again, understandably, because this has been a major anti-religion campaign, but we take the bait and we say, oh, yeah, well, your science is wrong and my religion is right. When what we should be saying is only from the standpoint of my religion does your science even make any sense at all. That's the real answer, right? Is that, of course, none of this makes any sense unless you think the universe has an order, unless you think it's a cosmos that was designed by a mind and all of this stuff. But instead, because we're now locked into this war where the contradictions are constantly heightening or whatever and we're just retrenching ourselves in into deeper and deeper like you know mirror world where we where we're going back and forth at each other the religious position now seems to be i want science to fail right i want the cosmologists who have been wrong and so everybody was very excited they were sharing this news story like look the they now they say the universe is twice as old as it was before and that just shows that all these numbers are fake but I was watching this happening and I was being like, guys, no, 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 wait, it's way, way worse than that. <laughs> it's way weirder. And, you know, we, we, we were sort of sharing that paper, but that paper didn't work. That was like a, an attempt to sort of resolve what is actually a much more profound issue about the total scrambling of, our, of the supposed order that we thought we had been able to extend out to the edges of the universe. And this is how it works, right? You have the order that you observe within this particular sphere, and then you kind of extrapolate out and you say, well, if that order holds, then it goes to the edges of the universe, and that's what it should look like. But then you get new observations, and it's like, oh, I thought that that dot was going to be over there, and it's like, you know, five light years to the left or something. And then you have to say, well, okay, so obviously the order that holds here doesn't hold at this at this larger level. And what is now, I suspect, going to happen is we're going to need to find a bigger order, just in the same way as the people who study quantum uh, physics and gravity, as I was talking about a while ago. Those people are needing to find another order at the level of very small. We clearly need a different system for understanding the l largest extent of the universe. That's what Scientists, that's the project scientists are actually working on underneath all of the, like, storm and drang. And whatever they discover, this is important, will not refute faith. <laughs> because that's not the kind of thing that the Bible is describing. And I know that, you know, there there are ways, and I respect the, these ways, to 
propose a young earth creation. And, and I know that I have listeners maybe that, that feel that way. That's not my understanding of what the author of Genesis is even on about. And there has been dispute about this throughout the history of, of the church tradition, church fathers arguing over like whether it was seven 24 hour days or not. Augustine says how it couldn't possibly have been. Other people, Thomas Aquinas, I think leans toward like, yes, it was the kinds of days that we observe. My Suspicion is that the more we know, the more we realize that it wouldn't even make any sense to talk about days before there were human beings to perceive them. The Bible is using the language from our experience, which is the experience of watching the sun move across the sky, to describe a deeper structure that is embedded in creation even before we arrive to perceive it. And a lot of this shows up in, like, Paradise Lost. I've been doing this audiobook reading of Paradise Lost, and you get Raphael says to Adam, he says, I'm going to tell you about the war in heaven before you were created, but I'm going to talk about it as if it were, like, people doing battle, essentially. And that's what the poem proceeds to do. The battle between Lucifer and and God's troops and, and the angels happens, it's described as if in an epic poem, like with Greek warriors on the battlefield or something. And Raphael says, this is because the things that your senses experience are real, but they are also analogs for imperceptible spiritual realities. So even though if you had been there, you wouldn't be able to see it with your eyes, like this is basically what was happening. And I suspect that that is how Genesis speaks of the origins of, of the universe. And if that's true, then we don't have to be afraid. I mean, there's there are things that we would have to r- wrestle with and, and grapple with. But our fear is because the scientism camp has basically taken this project of establishing certain knowledge about the physical world and turned it into a a world-owning and world-transforming project, which is what Dr. Faustus is about, and I'm going to get into that in, in a second. But we are now we now feel so culturally on the defensive as religious believers that we're always reacting against this whole thing. But really what we should be doing is watching and, and waiting to see what comes of this crisis in cosmology. Because they are going to now, you know, I suppose, spend a lot of effort trying to rejigger their basic assumptions. And let me tell you something else. I am not going to solve this problem. (laughs) I am not the person who is going to fix the problems in cosmology. And whenever you start talking about science, one of the things that people say to you is, well, who are you? You're not a scientist. Uh, Correct. (laughs) You got me. You brilliant sleuth. I, Spencer Clavin, uh, Oxford-trained classicist, am, am not an astrophysicist. This is correct. And so when they figure out what's up with these James Webb measurements, you're not going to hear about it first from me. I'm not the guy who's going to resolve this problem. This is, a, this is a problem for scientists to solve. This is a problem about measurement and observation and calculation. And that is the thing that science is there to do. So what I'm not going to do now is tell you what I think is really going on underneath all the cosmology. What I am going to do is speak about what I am qualified to speak about, and that is the meaning and implications of all of this for us and for our place in the universe and for our philosophy, which is kind of what I've been doing already. But this is the flip side of the I am not a scientist thing, is people say you're not a scientist, and what they mean by that is you have no right to speak. But scientists aren't philosophers either, and scientists are not literary scholars, although some of them have, you know, interest in the humanities. And so in just the same way as I am not going to be the guy that tells you what's up with the James Webb telescope, right? The scientists are not going to be the ones who tell you that, oh, God has been disproven. It's just not the mode of thought that they're trained in. And often when they talk about it, they're kind of dumb. Like back when Stephen Hawking said, you know, we can create the universe using just a few fundamental laws. You don't need God. And it's like, okay, that's a stupid thing to say. That's like not even sort of an interesting challenge to religion. That's just like somebody that hasn't really thought about these questions very much. Because, of course, where do the laws come from? And laws are not physical things. They are things that exist in a mind. And so presumably you need a mind to have the laws and yada yada. So that's the kind of stuff that I want to talk about with you because that's what I am interested in, what I think matters most for us right now, and and why I think this stuff is actually really important. And so to get into explaining sort of what's going on here and, and why cosmology has become sort of a hot and interesting topic, 
I want to talk a little bit about the origins of, of cosmology. So I mentioned that this comes from the idea that you can play the universe, the tape of the universe, backwards. And that tape is based on Einstein's relativity theory, speaking very generally. The relativity equations are the tool that enable you to observe stars, the universe expanding outward. And because Einstein describes reality not as a series of objects moving through an empty space, but as a fabric, essentially, of, of fields, he enables us then to calculate what it would look like if you played that tape in reverse. And this is basically what happens when a guy, a Catholic priest, interestingly, called George Lemaitre, starts to observe the, you know, expansion of the universe. He says, okay, so let me use these relativity equations, these Einstein equations, and, and play the tape backward. And he comes to, I'm going to read to you now from, from an amazing little passage and when he sort of describes this discovery. And I'm reading, if you're interested in some of this stuff, um, I'm reading from a very kind of remarkable book called On the Origin of Time by uh, Thomas Hertog. And Hertog is not like, I, I'm not commending him to you as somebody that I agree with everything he says or anything, but th he was kind of a protege of Stephen Hawking. And so he's got a lot of interesting stories about his time with Hawking, and then also he writes just a series of chapters here about some of the issues that are raised in, in modern cosmology. But he has this quote from Lemaitre, um, from l'hypothèse de l'atome primitif. So at this point, he's still thinking about it as a, a primitive atom, that back at the beginning of time, if you shrink the universe down and down, you eventually get to an atom in the true sense of atom that is the uncuttable, the smallest possible unit. And it turns out actually now that that is not like an atom of the size that we think of it, but a, a Planck space, which is the smallest conceivable, uh, that is measurable or observable space. And he says, we can compare space-time to an open conic cup. We move forward in time by following the cone upward to the top. We move through space by going around in circles. If we imagine going back in time, we reach the bottom of the cup. This is the first instant, the now, which has no yesterday, because yesterday... There was no space. On s'approche du fond de la coupe, on s'approche de cet instant unique qui n'avait pas d'hier parce qu'hier il n'y avait pas d'espace. I mean, it's so good, right? So one of the things that Einstein does is he makes time and space sort of woven together. And so as he's saying, if you if you go back in time and the space gets smaller and smaller, then if, if you reach a point where you can't get smaller anymore, you also reach a point where there can't be time before that. And therefore, the universe has an origin, and this is where you get the idea of the Big Bang. The, be the beginning is described by this smallest possible point. It's because if time and space are related, then the smallest possible point is also the earliest possible moment. Lemaitre was a contemporary, lived when Einstein also lived, and so got the opportunity to tell Einstein, look, it's sort of like that... Um, meme, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme where somebody comes to a, an adult, like a kid comes to an adult and presents something and says, I maked this. <laughs> I maked this. He's like, you know, so excited to show. And Lemaitre comes to Einstein with this interpretation of the, you know, telescope data and of relativity. And he says, look, I maked this. <laughs> and Einstein is horrified. <laughs> And it's one of the most amazing stories. He, he writes about it. Lemaitre writes about it in a, a little piece called My Encounters with Einstein. He says, I met Einstein for the first, 29, first time 29 years ago. This is, uh, he was, he's writing in 1957. So he had come to Brussels to attend the Solvay Congress of 1927. Walking through the avenues of the Leopold Park, he spoke to me about an article regarding the expansion of the universe passed almost unnoticed, which I had written the previous year, and a friend had him read. After some favorable technical observations, he concluded by saying that from the point of view of physics, it seemed to him absolutely abominable. Now, why would that be? What is abominable about this from the point of view of physics? Among the things that troubled Einstein about this was the idea that there's something outside of time, that there is a place or a moment, let's say, where once you go beyond that, there is no time. Because first of all, when you go beyond time, you no longer can reason using physical categories. You can't actually talk about location or movement or anything like that. But of course, also, if you can't observe and you can't reason physically, then you've reached 
a real thing that is inaccessible to the reasoning of, of science, which means that science can't describe the totality of existence. And of course, once you start talking about the beginning of time, you start to say, well, why did the singularity start to expand at all? And how did it all get going? And inevitably, you start to ask, from whatever angle you approach it, you start to think about God. And this was a big problem, because if there's a limitation to the universe, then there is a limitation ultimately it baked into the kinds of things that scientific reasoning can ascertain and therefore there is a space a, a, a location in our minds for where we must refer to metaphysics that which is beyond the physical and once you start talking about the limits of what we can observe and you start to butt up against a part of reality that cannot but in principle, in its nature, be accessed via the senses, you've moved out of Bacon's territory and you've started to say there are real things that aren't accessible to scientific reasoning. And if there's a day with no yesterday, if there's a time outside of time, the questions immediately arise from whatever angle you approach. It, it, you start to say, well, why did the singularity start to expand? And now that we have quantum the problems are even more intense because a quantum object exists in superposition with multiple possible paths forward, none of which can be said to be exclusively real. And this is one of the reasons why everybody's so into multiverse theory right now is because they want to say, well, maybe all the possibilities are, are real. But I've already talked on other episodes about why that falls apart and many of the world's best Scientists have said this is basically philosophy or religion. It's not science. And, and rightly so, because we're now at the place where philosophy needs to enter in and, and science can't give you answers. And multiverse philosophy isn't science. It's just, it's just bad philosophy. It's just a, a bad and obviously inconsistent possible religion because it creates contradictions and makes it impossible to even speak of anything at all if everything is always happening everywhere all at once and so on and so forth. So that's the many worlds interpretation of quantum physics. There's also string inflationary landscape cosmology, which proposes kind of this physical mechanism for the string landscape to generate a bunch of different bubble universes, which is just a really, really complicated way of kicking ye old can down ye road. Because, of course, if the string landscape is what generates the multiple universes, then you end up with the same problem about the string landscape. Where did it come from? Who made it? So on and so forth. It, this stuff becomes inescapable at the quantum level and at the cosmological level. And Lemaitre kind of waved this stuff away. He was always giving interviews where he was saying, no, no, faith and science are totally distinct. You don't need, you don't need relativity for, for revelation. You don't need revelation for relativity and all this stuff. You know, like. But the thing about this is Einstein was kind of right. I mean, he wasn't right, I don't think that this is a problem, but he was right that the if, if relativity is true, and it seems at least to be the truest description of the experiences that we had at the time, then you do start to butt up against not just, oh, we don't currently have measurement tools to observe this thing, but there are things that are inherently unmeasurable. And this is the same thing as, as quantum, right? Quantum mechanics also says when you reach a point beyond which the mind cannot go, then reality no longer starts to be answerable to the physical categories that human experience uses to filter whatever's out there. And so in quantum and in cosmology both, you do actually butt up against the space where you need to refer to metaphysics. And so it's no longer a question of like, well, once we get better measurements, it becomes a question of, oh, well, maybe like <laughs> measurements can only get us so far. And this is the like thing that I was insisting on a couple of weeks ago that makes the supernatural in its philosophical sense necessary to science. Because unless you can acknowledge that, all your scientific proposals start to sound like gibberish. And this drives people crazy. It is, in fact, the whole point of that famous now scene from one of my favorite new sci-fi novels, The Three-Body Problem. So I've now finally started watching The Three-Body Problem on Netflix. And just like when I read the books for the first time, I'm delighted to discover that everybody who was watching this show is having the same reaction I had when I opened the book, which is, holy crow, I cannot believe this opening scene. And the opening scene is a depiction of 
a struggle session at a university during the Cultural Revolution under Mao Zedong, in which science instructors are hauled forth and beaten and interrogated for the crime of teaching relativity theory and teaching cosmology and teaching the latest in what physics is discovering for exactly the reason that it opens up a space where the human mind is limited and reference to the supernatural becomes almost necessary in order to to think reasonably. Let me just, I want to read you this scene because this was so, when I read it, I was like, this can't have possibly, how did he publish this in China? It turns out he, he almost didn't. They had to put the scene in the middle of the book in China so that the censors wouldn't read all the way to it. But in the English version, it comes first, which is where he meant for it to be. And that's where they put it in the Netflix version, too. So this is this sci-fi novel, The Three-Body Problem, Chinese book. It begins with a depiction of this struggle session. And the professor who is being interrogated, it's a horrifying scene because he's being interrogated by his wife, whom they've basically gotten to, and then his former students and so on and so forth. So here they are interrogating him. They say, you also taught the Big Bang Theory. This is the most reactionary of all scientific theories. Imagine this. Imagine the Big Bang Theory, which we now think of as, or some Christians, I think, are tempted to reject as, like, the atheist theory of the universe. And it's been presented that way by some of its less cautious advocates, let's say. But imagine the Big Bang Theory as a reactionary anti-communist theory. And here's why. You taught the Big Bang Theory. This is the most reactionary of all scientific theories. Maybe in the future this theory will be disproven, the scientist answers. But two great cosmological discoveries of this century, Hubble's law and observation of the cosmic microwave background, show that the Big Bang Theory is currently the most plausible explanation for the origin of the universe. Lies, Shaolin shouted. Then she began a long lecture about the Big Bang Theory, remembering to splice in insightful critiques of the theory's extremely reactionary nature. But the freshness of the theory attracted the most intelligent of the four girls, who couldn't help but ask, Time began with the singularity. So what was there before the singularity? Nothing, yes said, the way he would answer a question from any curious young person. No, nothing? That's completely reactionary. The theory leaves open a place to be filled by God. <laughs> I, I, I've just, this scene, like, gets me every time. The young red guard, confused by these new thoughts, finally found her footing. She raised her hand, still holding the belt, and pointed at, yeah, you're trying to say that God exists. And he says, I don't know, which is... A totally valid scientific answers. I don't know. I'm not a science. I'm not a theologian. But the revolutionaries are cannot abide the science because it opens up the limitations of human knowledge, and in the limitations, we discover an inherent need for God, a philosophical need for the supernatural, in order to account for what what we're experiencing and, and discovering. And it's in the Netflix show. It's really good. Go watch it. This is a real thing. This is like a major feature of scientific discourse in the uh, during the Cultural Revolution in China. Uh, you can read. I'm reading now from a, a paper called the called Ideology and Cosmology: Maoist Discussion on Physics and the Cultural Revolution. So moving out of the fiction of the three body problem now into a, a real uh, academic paper. Why did Einstein become the main target? There were two reasons. First, Einstein was the most influential scientist of the century, a big shot to a great extent personifying the Western science in the eyes of Maoist ideologues. Only once the theory is relative, of relativity is discredited can natural science advance, was the rationale of the campaign. Second, and more specifically, Einstein's special relativity establishes a universe in which no absolute space or time exists. This absolute space and time is a major, it's kind of the backdrop of Newtonian mechanics, right? Um, and thus raised the suspicion of philosophical relativism and idealism. Einstein's general relativity is even more problematic because by interpreting gravitation as the curvature of space-time when applied to the entire universe, this theory inevitably inevitably leads to a finite but unbound model of the space-time continuum. This is true as a major feature of general relativity, that the universe is finite but unbound, which is to say that it's it's not actually infinite in all directions in the way that you might think of it in a Newtonian sense of, like, going out to infinity. In the Soviet Union, um, this disturbed Marxists with the implication of a limited universe— in the Soviet Union, for example, Zhdanov, the most powerful Stalinist ideologist, singled out Einstein in one of his famous speeches, criticizing his influence among Russian scientists. 
Stanov said that some of Russian scientists even calculated the age of the universe by applying Einstein's formula. In addition, like many other contemporary scientists, Einstein was under the philosophical influence of Ernst Mach. And so there are all these, you know, ideological problems with Einstein. But the main problem is the limitation, the boundedness of the universe. And I would say the boundedness thereby of physical knowledge, of the kind of knowledge that the senses can provide. This was also true in the Soviet Union, where they couldn't bear quantum physics. If you read Wonder Confronts Certainty, which I have here also, it's a great book by Gary Sal Morrison. He talks at one point about the rejection of quantum physics because quantum destroys determinism, as I talked about before. You can't, you can no longer imagine the universe as a machine that's bound to produce certain outcomes. And so the ideology of Marxism, which depends on human beings gaining total control, encapsulating the universe within the mind rather than moving outward from the mind into the universe, that ideology could not abide cosmology, couldn't abide the things that science as an open-ended inquiry was discovering. And so this stuff about James Webb is really critical because it presents us with two possibilities. Either we are going to rage and gnash our teeth like the Soviets and to some extent even like Einstein, although of course he didn't go around killing people over it. But, you know, are we going to rage against our limitedness and decide that this means we must kind of buckle down and just exert greater control? Or are we going to remember what was always true about science, which is that it has an open sky above it or else it can't function? Effectively, what we're doing as we extend our observations outward is we're coming up again against the fact that from within the universe, you cannot actually, what the Greeks would call katalambanein, you cannot take, comprise within your mind the whole of the universe. You are always going to be receiving from a larger wellspring that is outside of the physical world, a physical experience that you are having that communicates some truth to you. That's what cosmology itself actually implies, and it's also exactly what Dr. Faustus is about. So we are going to do more episodes on Dr. Faustus, but I wanted to lead into this by introducing Faustus to you. He's like Merlin. He's a sorcerer and kind of a, uh, he was a real person in the 16th century, but kind of shrouded almost immediately in legend as this, you know, semi-mythical figure. Very difficult to ascertain exactly what his real life was like, but he was an inspiration for many, many German folk tales. And he becomes the subject of a number of important works of literature. In particular, I want to talk to you today about Christopher Marlowe's play. And Marlowe was a contemporary of Shakespeare, so his language is sort of in the same mold, Elizabethan drama. But what's really interesting about reading Marlowe to me is you really see how Shakespeare was something altogether new because their language can be very similar and they both write an iambic pentameter and all of this stuff, but Marlowe really was the pinnacle, the, the final kind of consummation of an older art form that came out of medieval church drama and was very expressly in your face moralizing and told you a lot of stuff rather than showing you and the, you know things like now in cartoons where you get the devil on one shoulder and the angel on another and they're debating like do this no do that like this is my conflict here it is embodied right that's the sort of stuff that you get in Marlowe and this is a most Elizabethan drama at this time was kind of like this you get these revenge dramas about people you know taking back their agency when they've been wronged and all this stuff. And Marlowe is kind of the great of that era. And then you go turn from that to Shakespeare, where actually suddenly everything is internal and the words seem to come out of this wellspring of thoughts that maybe aren't being expressed. And there aren't really all these all that many like angels and demons on people's shoulders. There are supernatural entities, but there aren't like allegorical figures in the way that you would get in a morality play. Um so Marlowe's a great way to discover how, like, two great playwrights, but one who was a genius revolutionary and one who was, in some sense, the, you know, consummation of, a, of an older tradition. But, you know, the story of Faust is very simple. He's, he's a very brilliant philosopher, 
the, uh, not theologian exactly, but like a, you know, a, sci- a natural scientist. A- and this era, of course, these are all kind of intertwined, right? M- magic and science and the occult and all of these things are all part of one project. So he's just a, a philosopher, a knower of things. And he gets to the limits of his knowledge and becomes exhausted and starts to feel like, well, is this all there is? And he starts then to invoke uh, magic and alchemy. And that's where Mephistopheles, the servant of the devil, comes to him and says, you can have everything you want. You can have power over all the physical world if you just serve me. And what's really interesting about this play and really smart about this play is, you know, we think of it, if you if you know anything about Dr. Faustus, you think, oh yeah, Faustus sort of gives up on theology and turns instead to magic. But he actually doesn't quite give up on theology. What he tries to do is to incorporate theology into his grand theory of the universe. It's like he wants the whole world sort of wrapped up in a ball that he himself can control and contain. And reading this play again, I was reminded of how when you see depictions of evil sorcerers, they so often have like a sphere or an orb or a crystal ball where they can sort of see the whole world. Like think of the Palantir in Lord of the Rings or any of these other depictions where you'll see the shadow of the magician hovering over the whole world because that's the distinction that's being drawn here between good natural science and evil magic. Natural science is takes place under the roof of theology, but magic attempts to bring theology under the sway of natural science because it's about denying that there is anything outside of our human uh, sensory experience, that anything comes out from outside of what we can reach into us, because that would make us dependent, it would make us limited, it would mean that what we can discover physically about the world isn't everything there is to know, and of course, those are all the things that we now cannot handle, and what we want instead is to incorporate everything into our own sphere of understanding, which is why we're constantly extrapolating our rules that we know about our current experience outward to the end of the world, and insisting, like the struggle session Marxists, right, insisting that this is the science and it's absolutely settled. And so now that, you know, it turns out it's not so settled, that there are actually always going to be open edges around the furthest reaches of our scientific knowledge, some people, like the scientist I read to you from the beginning, are very excited about that because that's the sincere joy of real knowledge of the natural world is, look, there's more. There's always more coming in from outside. It's like being a child, being given candy, right? It's like, yeah, now you're ready for the next thing. You're ready for the next part. But of course, the the desire is, and now I have complete control. I get to say what comes next. I get to determine cause and effects absolutely. And so here's what happens when, when Faustus turns to magic. He doesn't throw his Bible away. He takes his Bible along with him. He has these two sort of tempters that lead him into it. And one of them says to him, Haste thee to some solitary grove, and bear wise bacons and Albertus works, the Hebrew Psalter and New Testament, and whatsoever else is requisite. We will inform the air our conference cease. So Bacon and Albertus and the Hebrew Psalter and the New Testament, right? He's already read the Bible and said, well, that doesn't, you know, give me what I want. But now he's being told, like, no, everything is going to be brought under the governing aegis of one system of cause and effect. And that is evil magic and evil science, both at the same time. Here's Faustus. Now that the gloomy shadow of the earth, longing to view Orion's drizzling look, leaps from the Antarctic world unto the sky and dims the welkin with her pitchy breath, Faustus, begin thine incantations and try if devils will obey thy hest, seeing thou hast prayed and sacrificed to them. Within this circle is Jehovah's name, forward and backward, anagrammatized. If you've been listening to my translation pieces, I've been talking about how the name of God can never be pronounced. This is what Faustus is doing. He's trying to take the name of Jehovah and gain ownership over it, forward and backward, anagrammatized, right, to put it into physical embodied language, right? The abbreviated names of holy saints, figures of every adjunct to the heavens and characters of signs and erring stars by which the spirits are enforced to rise. Then fear not, Faustus, but be resolute and try the uttermost magic can perform. Sint mihi dei acherontis propitii. May the gods of Acheron be propitious unto me. Waliat numen triplex Yehovah. Let the threefold name of God 
give me power i mean it's it's once you realize what's going on it's actually a really horrifying scene you have to kind of like tang you have to sort of sort through the elizabethan language and all that but the implication here is is that effort that tower of babel effort to make a name for ourselves and to bring everything and i would even say that this might be one implication of the temptation in the garden of eden that what what are they offered? They're offered fruit that they can take into their bodies and have comprehensive knowledge of good and evil, as if like they were able to sort of encircle it physically themselves and to pin it down. And that's what Faustus wants. That's what the worst advocates of scientism are claiming and basically have claimed since the days of Laplace. It's what the Tower of Babel builders wanted, and it's the opposite of actual science, which takes place under the aegis of that open sky of what is unknowable to the senses, but knowable to the heart. And there, of course, is where God lives, and despite whatever you may hear about the multiverse, is in fact the word that sets the singularity spinning and exploding and and brings the universe into being at his command. All right, more on Faustus next week, but for now I want to take a quick mailbag, which I hope will be sort of clear what my answer is going to be here on the basis of the of the episode. But this is a a nice question that I got from Substack. If you want to ask me a question, you should sign up to my Substack, rejoiceevermore.substack.com. And you'll get a weekly newsletter from me. You will get that Paradise Lost uh, audiobook if you would like to pay to support me. All of that would be much appreciated. That would all be great. But you can also ask me questions either via email or there's a now a Substack DM feature. And if you're a subscriber, I'll take uh, questions that way. So here's Andrew in the DMs. He says, Spencer, I've been digging the discussion of magic. It's brought to mind two contrasting reactions to the truths you discussed that I'd love to know your thoughts on. Lewis, as I'm sure you know, observed the roots of science in magic and walked away with a heightened sense of caution towards science, as in that hideous strength. Jung, on the other hand, observed these same shared roots and seems to have become obsessed with magic, e.g. the alchemical texts, the red book, etc. This is true. Jung was majorly interested in alchemy, especially as a mode of dream interpretation and so so on. I can't quite tell, but you seem to be walking a line between them. What do you make of these two figures as emblems of sorts for how we might investigate these questions? Lewis seems to draw the line in time at the incarnation, or at least the reception of the gospel. You seem to have different lines. I'd love to know your thoughts on the above. Thanks for all you do and keep at it. God bless you and yours. Thanks, Andrew. This is a great question. And I will say, temperamentally, instinctively, I am always drawn to the Lewis reaction. And it's one reason why I'm often trying to, you know, poke holes in that reaction because I'm aware of it in myself that I'm always drawn to withdraw. I always think, ah, get it away from me. Like, this seems bad, you know. Um, but then the more I think about withdrawing, the more I realize that you can't withdraw all the way. And I don't think Lewis thought you could withdraw all the way. Um, I agree with him that the incarnation drew a fundamental line in in time, but I don't think it was a line after which we weren't supposed to be doing science anymore or whatever. I actually think it was a line after which all science needed to come away from the influence of magic and demons and into the influence of Christ and be guided by do thou as I do, right? Because he says, you will do the things I do and do more yet still. And I think that applies to science, which means that when we start asking, well, how do we go away from the Faustian project and toward kind of good science, good magic, and and the open sky, I think the answer is, like, what are the things that Christ does? He heals the sick. He gives sight to the blind, right? Enlightens the darkness. And, and these are the things that cannot be catalambanoed. They cannot be uh, overcome by the darkness. And, and everything that we discover and do should be pointed and aimed in that direction. Um I think that Jung is, I mean, he's a very, very complicated figure, Jung is, because he, unlike Freud, I think, really understands the primacy of symbols and symbolism. And that's one reason why somebody like Jordan Peterson, I think, is really interested in Jung, is because Freud, kind of, his instinct is always to clear away the symbols and get to what's really, quote-unquote, underneath, whereas Jung has this opposite idea kind of that like the symbols are the the urgent the, the the most primal thing about us and if you got down somehow to like the primordial element of the human soul it would be 
like a, a, a cosmic symbol. It would be some kind of image or story that conveys us and the essence of us. And so in that sense, I really, I think Jung is right to sort of recover the magical nature of science. And, and I would maybe even, now that I'm talking about it, I would, I would think that it, Lewis and Jung might not be so different as they initially appear, although Jung is less confident theologically and therefore I think ultimately less satisfying. But Lewis and Jung are both saying there's been an attempt to drain this project of all its mystery because there's been an effort or a desire to bring it under total human control and to seal off the universe into that magician's crystal ball. And that is evil. That's actually wrong because science itself, by nature, requires an, an open-endedness to it. And it's at the end of that open-endedness, like the, in the day with no yesterday or at the place where, you know, in very small spaces, our uh, observational techniques won't pick anything up or the place where we're out at the furthest edges of the universe finding more mysteries, right? It's at those places that we discover we're always receiving something from, from outside of nature into nature. And, you know, I think that is really what Lewis is trying to uncover in that hideous strength is to say, like, yeah, this is, this is magic. And so tread carefully, but understand it through the lens of the incarnation, and receive from outside of nature what will guide your use of nature. And Jung is like a little bit more kind of, you know, well, nature has symbols in it sort of automatically. And so we have to recover the sense that when we're working with nature, we are working with this kind of magical, mystical, symbolical thing. And I guess that's like strikes me as a little bit more pagan than you know, Christian, like that is sort of an attempt to return to paganism, whereas Lewis is an attempt to move beyond modernity into a revitalized Christianity that does science, but does it in the Arthurian magical way. And I think that that's, he was right that that's kind of the way forward, because he was also right that you can't go back. And that's the point, by the way, of the the line that Lewis draws in time, is that once you know something, you can't unknow it. And so there's no return to the pagan groves. There's no just recovering, like, gods within nature. What you now have to do is understand that God is outside of nature and receive the infusion of the Godhead into nature. I think that that's kind of where I would fall on that. So, as always, I'm going to list more toward Lewis, but my... Temper- temperament is just to retreat from the whole thing altogether. And so part of this stuff that I'm talking about with you is an effort not to retreat, but to be unafraid and to move forward toward a sort of Lewis vision of how can there be a continuous through line between King Arthur's court and the ever expanding project of human knowledge, rather than the NICE, the villains in that book, who want to like curtail the space so that their knowledge can be absolute, right? They want to stop up the universe into this little crystal fishbowl, crystal ball, so they can control it. And that's what Faustus wants to do, which is why we will talk more about him as well next week. Thank you for that question. That's uh, really helpful. And actually, it's I always like sort of thinking through these questions in real time because they help me to clarify what I'm going to talk about next. Um, if you want to ask those questions one more time, you go to rejoiceevermore.substack.com. I will put a bunch of links in the description of this episode. Please don't forget to subscribe if you're new here. Welcome. Very, very glad to have you. But uh, we do an episode every week, so I'd love to have you back. Just uh, hit that subscribe button. Please rate the podcast five stars so other people can find it. All that good stuff that you know how to do. Share it talk to people about it, tell your friends, tell your mom, text your group chat, all that good stuff. And I will see you next week for more truth, beauty, and the stuff that matters.